everyone. There's a lot of misconceptions about what the Bible supposedly says and what the scientists say happened with the creation of the universe. So let me try to clarify a few points about all this and make it a little clearer. First of all, the creation account in the book of Genesis is more poetry than prose. The six days finishing with the Sabbath represents that of the Jewish working week and the author was telling his fellow Jews that they must rest on the Sabbath just as God himself rested after all his work of creation. What the author of the creation account has in mind is not science but theology and he speaks of the world in non-scientific language. When the author of Genesis wrote this account the Israelites were living at the heart of a very pagan surroundings in Babylon that's 500 to 600 BC. Now the Babylonians also had a creation account in their literature and the author of Genesis was influenced by their stories. In the second chapter of the book of Genesis, the book of Genesis tells us about the creation of man and woman. Now this is full of figurative language and symbolism. Now it's not that we are being told whimsical fairy tales, but that the author is teaching profound truths about humans in vivid and colourful language. For instance, there seems to be a circus-like parade of animals before Adam. He names them as they pass, but he finds none similar to himself. Now this was to teach us that man is lord of the animal world and that he is the only rational animal. The garden is important as well because for the Israelites it means wealth and happiness. The Garden of Eden represents the idyllic state of man before sin enters the world. It also shows man in terms of an easy and gracious familiarity with God. Man speaks with God directly. The serpent represents evil because, probably because the Canaanites used serpents in their crude fertility cults. Also serpents were crafty and dangerous. The serpent represents forces which are hostile to God. The sin of our first parents was primarily, primarily that of pride. The serpent told them they would be like gods, knowing good from evil. The temptation was for man to live his life without reference to God. Man himself would decide what is good and evil and could be his own God. Man was seduced into claiming for himself moral autonomy and thereby trapped into renouncing his proper role as creature. Isn't this the root of all our sins as well? By the way, there is no mention that the forbidden fruit was an apple. Satan had promised them knowledge. Now they have it, but it's not what they expected. Before the sin, the Bible tells us they were naked but not ashamed. After the sin, they covered themselves up with fig leaves. Love could easily turn to lust. That is, they could use each other for their own selfish pleasure. Hence they cover up. And man now tries to hide from God and he sees him as a threat, no longer as a friend. The basic message of Genesis 1 to 3 is that everything made by God is good because God is good. He's all goodness. All the ills of man arrive from man's own errors. He abuses his freedom. Man and man alone was responsible for sundering that bond of friendship and in succumbing to the serpent. In succumbing to the serpent, the grim reaper enters the stage of human history. A dark shadow is also cast over the whole of creation. But even in the book of Genesis, God promises a saviour or a second Adam who would undo the work of Satan, destroy death and set man on the right path towards the new paradise of heaven. Here are a few questions to ask yourselves. First, man, 
that is man generic, is the only rational creature mentioned in the book of Genesis. So is there a danger among animal lovers that they sometimes have a tendency to humanize pets, that is, particularly man's best friend? Because if that's the case, what about the turkey you had for Christmas? Second, the serpent who represents Lucifer is a fallen angel who, in his deception of Adam and Eve into believing they will be God's equal, he brings about the fall of the human race. Where, in your opinion, is the great deceiver particularly at work today? Do you even believe in this dark force? Last, when could love turn to lust? What does Christ say about it? Thank you all very much for listening and God bless you all.